Hello again, my name is Wayne Sedlock. I'm here with Dr. Robert Morey. We are embarking upon the fourth major locus of the mind map, that chart that you have in your set. We're going to be dealing with ethics, arguably the most important area, because God wants you and I to act, and to act well. Commit your works unto the Lord, it says in Proverbs 16, and your thoughts will be established. Dr. Bob, we hear the opposite in our Greco-Roman society, don't we? <laughs> Get your philosophy down, know why it is before you do anything. Whereas God says, no, obey me by faith, do what I tell you, and as you commit those works unto him, you learn his mind better. We're dealing with ethics. Well, most people have never thought to ask the question, can evil become good? Can good become evil? They are aware of the verse, overcome evil with good. good. That's right. And also good can be overcome by evil. That's right. Is evil always evil? And part of it depends on how you define it. The humanist would tend to say evil is restricted to pain and suffering. Well, let's deal with those questions. Bob, is evil always evil? No. Illustrate. Well, for example, uh, the evil of pain and suffering, uh, God gave us bodies that could register pain so that you know to go to the doctor and you discover you have cancer or you have some other problem. Or a splinter in your foot. Splinter in your foot. The evil, quote unquote, is there to protect your life. And so you must understand that can be the case. Now, most of the time people are thinking of just rules, but we're talking about evil good and good evil. Uh, the death of Christ, we've already mentioned, was the worst evil in the history of man, even more heinous than the sin of Adam and Eve. And yet that death of Christ was Good Friday, planned <laughs> and predetermined by God from all eternity. And see, this leads us to understand that the open view of God, which says God doesn't know the future. I actually quote in uh, my book, The Battle of the Gods, one author says, God did not know that Christ would die. It was just his unlucky day, you doesn't see. doesn't know his Bible, does he? Well, then, then he has no solution to evil. Right. Because Christ's death was not part of the solution. And then you have those in the new perspective on Paul who deny justification through the imputation of Christ's righteousness to our account. Now, they usually deny Adam's sin. Adam's sin imputed to us, our sins imputed to Christ, his righteousness imputed to us. And they sweep that away, and they still think they're Christians. It's interesting. They're not Christians. It's Evil, impossible. Evil's not always evil. For example, I, was, I, I have to admit that as a young man, I, was, I learned in class that you, know, you have a forest fire, but sometimes that's needed. It clears away an awful lot, and the ecology afterwards recovers better, faster, and it makes for a better growth in the, in the parks, for example. Yes, and even the psalmist <clears throat> said, it was good for me that I was afflicted, afflicted. That's right. that I might learn your ways. Right. And you see, people tend to internalize Evil is only that which is pain and pleasure for me. So if they f get rid of God's law, they don't care about standards. If something is to my liking, very narcissistic, very self-centered, very selfish, that's good. And if it isn't, it's evil. And this also even uh, when you deal with those involved, what's called the prosperity teaching, where God does not want anybody to experience evil all Christians should have the keys of the Cadillac. Uh, sickness is wrong automatically. Uh, it's due to sin. They don't understand the scriptures. Well, even healing. Yes. Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. It's pretty clear that Paul did not have this instant authority to heal anything in his, in his path. 
No, he didn't Trophimus, have the gift of his, healing in his back that's right. pocket. The no. Trophimus ever left him to lead him sick. It's a simple verse. And Epaphrodite's almost died. That's correct. But you must understand that evil can be good, good can be evil, evil can be overcome by good, good can be overcome with evil. You can have a good person and they get overcome by drug addiction and pornography and, and all of that. And we're describing why so many people have a problem with the problem of evil. They yes. say, well, it's all relative. God has given his holy law. Yes. The standard there, from there we begin to discern what good, when it is good, what is evil, when it is evil, when pain, for example, is yes. actually evil, when pain is good for me. Yes. I actually did a diagram when I was lecturing on ethics. The word sin had 14 different <laughs> meanings. But well, we won't go into that. Uh, but you must understand that in terms of the ethics of evil, we must let Scripture tell us affliction can be good. Right. This man was born blind, not due to some sin of his parents. He was blind for the glory of God. Right. Some sickness is under the glory of God. Some is chastisement for sin. Not always. But Christ the scripture was delayed. explains to us these Christ things. Christ was delayed. He delayed raising Lazarus. Yes. For your sake. For Lazarus to die. That's right. And well, you Lord, you, 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 you should have come here. He delayed coming for their sakes. For their sake. And then he and raised Lazarus. That's and right. Here's the thing is that God utilizes evil. And this is where many, many Christians, uh, those into middle knowledge and following uh, right. the cult right. of Mormonism, uh, that's an attempt to get around the concept of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. But again, it comes back to this one thing. When you deny the sovereignty of God, the atoning work of Christ, when you deny hell, a conscious eternal torment of the damned, you have denied the only solution, solution. to evil in God's world. That's right. And so this, let me ask, I know you've covered it, let's do it again. Can good sometimes be evil? Paul says, let not your good be spoken of as evil. The, the scripture says, for example, something can be perfectly good. For example, uh, uh, for you to have a beer on a hot summer day. There's nothing in scripture That's that right. condemns that. In fact, the elders in the Old Testament were paid with wine, yep. beer, and strong drink. Yep. God ordered it. But in some circles, Paul says, now, if you're in the presence of the weaker brethren, right. whose conscience has been flawed by the world, the world telling them Christians cannot drink. They're scarred. They're scarred. Uh, in the, the common God's vernacular, they're psychologically scarred. Yeah, right. but you have the world has all of these impossible standards for Christians that we never sin, we never do nothing on, on, on the line. And for the sake of the weaker brethren, I wouldn't drink that beer. Right. So Paul says, don't let that which is good be evil spoken of. And it goes back and forth. But again, God's word is the standard by which we define something as evil or good. So we're not relativists. When we say, when we ask the question, is evil always evil? No. Is good sometimes evil? Yes. yes. Is evil sometimes good? Yes. yes. We're not relativists because behind those questions that everybody in the world faces, and if they choose to throw away the scripture, they're going to be lost in a sea of relativity. We step back and say that God's holy law defines good and evil. Righteous, actually, it's not just good and evil. It's righteousness well, and a, evil. Uh, the perfect example is Joseph. Yes. Joseph had some brothers that were jealous of him. They beat him up and threw him in a pit. Then they sold him into slavery where he was abused. And then he ended up in jail on false rape charges in Potiphar. And then in the end, he ended up second to Pharaoh. That's right. All right? He finally meets those wicked brothers. And this is what he said. You meant evil, evil. 
But God meant it for good. But God intended it for good. Right. So what they thought would be the end of Joseph and evil, God actually used. And he explains how. Because of his position, he could bring the Jews, Jacob and the rest, to where there was food. But they even did Joseph. not starve to death. He was put in a position right. to be there to help the people of God. That's a great illustration because we add to that, within that narrative, Joseph did not relativize what they had done to him. No, he, he said arranged you did them, evil. He, they, he arra they didn't know it was he. He arranged them from the uh, in their order of yes. birth. So when they knew that they've been arranged, that they're sitting by way of preeminence down in, in ascending, descending order, they knew something was up. They concluded that God was judging them. Joseph was calling them to repentance. I haven't heard you yet. I haven't manifested myself yet. When he came and showed himself, he couldn't contain himself any longer. He showed himself to them. They were afraid. Oh, they said, and we're they should have been it now, baby. Yeah, and they should and have been see, afraid. See, this is where but he forgave. You them. know the old story: the Calvinists and the Arminian fell down the stairs, <laughs> and the sure. Arminian stood up. <gasps> Why me? Yeah. Why me? The Calvinist got up, brushed himself off, and said, Whew, I'm glad that's over with. <laughs> What's next? Meaning, belief in the sovereignty of God is what gives sanity to the Christian life. No matter what happens to me, God is working all things together, the good, the bad, and the ugly, for my good and his glory. Anything that comes into the circle of my personal experience is there through the will of God to make me more like Jesus. Let's expand upon that. We did that in the last lesson. You did so. Uh, it was a marvel to hear you talk about the individual, the family. There you go. The church and the nation. And the nation. Let's, let's deal with that. There are so many out there that don't like the doctrine of predestination. That the, uh, the big oh, P word. Oh, they don't like God's the, the, sovereignty. The they don't like it. They don't well, like God having a plan to solve the pro that's problem right. of evil. They don't understand that the foreknowledge, whom he foreknow, he also predestined. It's not just cognizance. He was planning. And for a nation, he moved to carry it out. You know, in one of the greatest economic theses ever written, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, um, Dr. Max Weber wrote, there were two doctrines that revolutionized commercial enterprise. And he said they both came out of the Protestant Reformation. Predestination and justification. Predestination, and he illustrated, there was a, ma a Dutchman, Dutch merchant, who believed that God called him to go to Indonesia, get the, get the spices, trade for them, and come back, reap the profit, an enormous profit, but he put that money into furthering his business, building churches, hmm. building schools, building orphanages. Then he went on back. Yeah, He did the same thing. He said, I would, for profitability, P-R-O-F-I-T, for profit, on that basis, that ethic, I would sail into the, sail into the very gates of hell hmm. to procure a profit. Now, the average person not knowing that man's understanding of the scripture would say, oh, he's just greedy. That's not greed. Yep. There's a good example of how good can be made evil and how some men's greed can actually be transferred into a, a, an enlightened understanding of the use of money, and should be. Yeah. It's redemptive. Money is properly redemptive. He took, that man was so successful, he trusted that God had built his business for him, therefore he had a purpose. He faced with courage evil, knowing that, like you just said, the Calvinist brushes himself off and says, well, I'm glad I'm over, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're done, I'm done with that. Same is true with this man. Practically speaking, he knew he had to, build those churches, those schools, those orphanages, he had to take the risk. He gleaned the profitability. He then took it over into, it's a real history, um, immense wealth that became the basis for churches in the Netherlands. Well, the realization that my life is little, but a weaving between my Lord and me, I cannot choose the colors, he worketh steadily. Oftentimes he chooses sorrow, and I in foolish pride. Forget he see the upper, and I the underside. The dark threads are as needful in the weaver's skillful hand 
as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned, uh -huh. not to the loom is silent, and the shuttle cease to fly, will God unroll the canvas and explain the reason why. <laughs> God would not send the darkness if he felt we could bear the light. We would not cling to his guiding hand if the way were always bright. So he sends the blinding darkness and the furnace sevenfold heat. Tis the only way, believe me, to keep you close to the master's feet. That was shared with me by Corey Ten Boone as I drove her around New York City. And she understood that without confidence that God is sovereign over the problem of evil, over the problem of evil, there is no hope to understand evil because then it came out of just luck and chance. But only way to live is to live to understand it is a tapestry. I remember uh, uh, this one professor uh, back in Bible college who challenged me. He did not believe in the sovereignty of God. He said, do you believe God is sovereign over evil? Yes. And he put out as like a bulldog. Oh, they get they, I they looked get at him and said, yes. That's right. He said, that's ridiculous. I said, was he sovereign over the death of Christ? That's not for you to ask. See, they never do. The open view, the deniers of God's sovereignty, uh, those who believe in chance, sometimes called free and will, yet, but chance and luck. See, there's they don't no know meaning. their scriptures. No, not, they don't know the scriptures. It pleased the Lord to bruise him, to put him to grief. Yes. Isaiah 53. The marvel of 700 years before Christ, the I Isaiah is looking into the future, pulling back the curtains of time Describe and saying that the Christ would be, would be taken. The servant of the Lord would yeah. be taken, yeah. and it would please God to bruise him and put him to grief, to make his soul an offering for, for sin. sin. The day Christ died, I don't know if I ever told you that, I counted up how many prophecies were fulfilled in the one day that Christ died, 33. Now, what is the mathematical probability? It's impossible. Of one man at one place at one time having 33 prophecies fulfilled which were out of his control. Psalm, for example, uh, 22. 22. Right. They gave me vinegar and gall to drink. Right. They gambled for my clothes. In other words, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? See, with the, psalm the itself. sovereignty of God, the responsibility of man, uh, the fact that God has ordained history, that it's his story, Christ came in the fullness of time, according not only to the foreknowledge of God, but also to his foreordination. That is what gives the strength and the backbone. And that's why we look in terms of the ethics of evil that God turns our lemons into lemonade. Doc, we need to repeat that. We need to see that courage is a function of faith in the Lord to face what he calls us to face. Yes. Otherwise, people who don't have a view of God's overriding sovereignty of a thing. In other words, they see the powers of man, they see the powers of tyrants, they see the power of the devil, yeah, and they yeah. conclude, I can't deal with that. Francis Schaeffer put it this way, there's only enough room in this universe for one free will. And he you said, know, what? We all <laughs> said, what? That back to Brie, he said, now look, you got <laughs> stranded Lord's. on a desert island, okay? Yep. And you were alone. Now, as time went along, you took your clothes off. They were rotting anyway. You could march around that island right. stark naked. Right. Whenever you wanted some fruit, you would get it. You want a coconut. You had complete freedom on that island to do as you please. Then another guy got shipwrecked. <laughs> he swam to shore. And after he was finally conscious, all of a sudden, he says, geez, get a leaf, get a <laughs> leaf. You were no longer free to march around the way you wanted to. And when you reached to get that bed fruit, he said, I want that fruit. Now it became a conflict. There was only enough room <laughs> on that island for one ultimate will. He said the same thing with the universe. Those who think 
God is passively watching. He's passive. He's watching chance-based future events. That is, God doesn't know what's going to happen. It's all based on chance. And when Jesus died, it was his unlucky day, and God yeah. didn't know. You see, that whole scheme we have today, all of these different theologies, the open view, uh, middle knowledge, uh, Malin, all of these things are directed by Satan to only do main thing, rob us of the only solution to the problem right. of evil given in Scripture. You know, when you speak of ethics and the problem of evil, General Stonewall Jackson, of course, he got his name standing like a stone wall in front of his men doing his duty. They could see him. The enemy fired upon him. Yeah. And he was at breakfast with a another general. And the general was not a believer at the time. He said, General, how is it that you can stand there in the name of God open to the fire of your enemies? How can you do that? And Stonewall Jackson turned to him and said, General, my religion teaches me that I'm as safe in battle as I am in bed. Well, the same, his courage, his yes, courage yes. was derived, his ethic was derived from the fact God had called him to his duty. Yes. He wasn't going to be foolish with his life. He but is we're immortal duty. until his time. That's right. He had his duty to perform. And if God called him at that moment, so be it. Now, He'd be found faithful at the time yeah. doing his duty. Our Lord Jesus, we know how he bled in the garden before he, yeah. had, to face, before he had to face crucifixion. Nonetheless, on the cross, it was... Thy will be done. Thy will and be done. And he gave up his spirit. He rele he's he the relinquished only human it, that's being, because right. he was man of very man, as well as God, who willed himself to he die. He gave permission to die. We can't do that. We can't do he that. He gave permission now, to die. Kipling. But he faced it all by the courage of doing, I do always those things of my Father. All right. Our well, Lord I'm Jesus, same thing. I'm going to test knowledge of, of authors. Kipling. Rudyard. Wrote Jungle Book, mm -hmm. Gunga Dean, great movie. How did he describe the Calvinist soldiers from Scotland who came out of the trenches in their kilts? Do you know the phrase he used for those Scotsmen? Ladies from hell. <laughs> and he went on and said, they knew. <laughs> yep that if the bullet did not have their name on it, it they could it. not die. You know our forefathers at Lexington, the description of the British, when the Minutemen were there first, yeah. of course, a lieutenant said, when we as the grenadiers, they had grenadiers there, when we fired upon them, of course we have to reload. Many of those Minutemen realized the only way to save the men on the hill was that they simply not reload and fling themselves at the enemy to disrupt their ranks. He said, these men were veritable fools, and yet their courage, they were certain to die, but their courage was so disruptive, we could not Well, at the forefront were the Presbyterians and the Baptists. Uh, the Anglicans were not there. They were loyalists. We must understand most of Washington's generals were Presbyterian. Presbyterian. There's a sprinkle of Lutherans and the Baptists Absolutely. were put hip deed in this. But I'm saying, not <laughs> denomination, what I'm saying is this. The greatest evil you will face in your life when you die, most people think, right. can be the door to heaven. Paul says to die is what? Gain. Gain. To right. be with Christ, which is far better. In other words, what the world views as evil because it's chance-based and it's the luck of the draw and the cards. No, God is sovereign. But it's I needful. I am immortal until my time. That I mean, I have become irresponsible. Right. It means I have a confidence. Job 14, the day of your death has been decreed, Wayne. And even you can't Paul. lengthen it or shorten it. It's already been in the books. And even Paul said, but it's needful for me to remain. Yes. It's much better if I go on, Yeah. but it's needful. So the price for loving your neighbor is to stay 
and face the problem of evil on their behalf yes. to help redeem them. And your life should count for overcoming evil. Right. Evil in your own individual life by getting rid of the wickedness, the sin, and isn't your family, that, the church, rooting it out. And by isn't God's that the grace. ethic required of a spouse toward their spouse? Of we have this easy view of marriage, but isn't it needful from a Christian perspective that spouses are united in their mutual love to help overcome? Well, again, in my encyclopedia, it's called Practical Christianity. What can a wife do to help her husband to become a godly man? What can a husband do right. to help his wife become? And see, I'm giving practical steps how to raise your kids for Christ. Have biblical standards. It takes courage to face that, though. It yes. takes a real commitment in understanding evil because you have to face you have the to affliction. Face it. it might not be the most pleasant reaction you get from your spouse or your son or your neighbor. Oh, that's right. But a building, for example, as Edith Schaefer called it, a theistic environment at home. I didn't allow any wicked posters in my home. Uh, now, tattoos, just as a tattoo, are not condemned in Scripture. You can have a tattoo of a flower or whatever. The tattoos that were being condemned were those of idols. Same thing with earrings. It was like a, wearing a little Buddha world face. View, world view wickedness. Yes, is yes. Condemned. In other words, you do not allow in your home the atmosphere of the evil. Right. I love it that when people come to my home, they said, I feel peace. Right. I feel safety. When someone comes to your home, do they feel peace, safety, a refuge, godliness? Or do they hear chaos with this horrible, disjointed music? And, of course, I have a whole view, a Christian view of art that's in uh, this one, as a matter of fact, deals with the Christian view of art, a Christian view of psychology, and all of this stuff. You must understand, you must apply the Christian view to all of life. Remember, we're going to be dealing in our last lesson with aesthetics. Oh, He's talking about that. Well, we better not... Uh, We've moved too much from food. the commitment yes. of good and bad works and yes. what that yes. means. But there's a beautifying or the opposite in civilization. And God takes that seriously. It's not just how sincere I am, Bob. Results do count with the Lord. It's not the only thing, but they count. Yes. We have now metaphysics. Evil exists. We have, of course, an epistemology. We can know all about it. We can know all about it, what to do about it. It That's is solvable. Right, because we've got information right. from heaven about it. It's real. It's part of the world. And it's necessary for now. We have the commitments that ethics yes. draws from, well, good and evil both. God's yeah, commandments yeah. and, of course, disobedience. So what we're going to do, we're going to deal with the ethics. It's not just about how pretty a tattoo might be or how ugly it might be. But you know, in music, how about the fact that as a Christian, you're a walking, talking, breathing civilization. In seed form, people see you, they, see, they should see something supernaturally different, a new way of life. Bob, we're going to come back to that. All right. Hope you like that. Hope you go on to that last lesson. And call it aesthetics. A little bit more, Francis Schaeffer's little book, Art in the Bible. We'll deal with More it. More than what I gave. Dr. Bob, thank you very thank much. You.